government time says, standard time says it's time to start. Glad everybody could be here this morning. Our first song will be number 255. 255. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alert my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth, he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Pass a sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Please turn to uh, number 160. 160. And then Brendan will have our opening prayer after this song. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name, glory to his name. Safe from sin, and Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory Blood applied, Lord. 
Good morning, and thank you for being here this morning. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with us as we are here today, and thank you for allowing us to be here to worship you. Guide us and direct us, and in your name, amen. Number 217, 217, and Kurt will lead us in taking the communion after the song. He loves me. Why did the Savior heaven leave and come to earth below? receive because he loved me so he loves me loves me he loves me this I know he gave himself to die for me because he loves me so why did the Savior mark the way and why temptation, oh, why teach and toil and plead and pray, because he loved me so. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me, because he loves me so. Why feel the garden's dreadful dross? Why through his trials go? Why suffer death upon the cross? Because he loves me so. He loves me. Because he loves me so. That him was an excellent. excellent song to focus our minds and prepare us for participating in the Lord's Supper this morning. At the lectureship this weekend, the focus of that event was the parables, many of which we have already covered in our studies here on Wednesday evenings when we went through uh, a number of the parables that uh, Brian led. And, of course, the title for that weekend, this weekend, was The Pointed Parables. Uh, however, I want to talk about a parable this morning in preparation for participating in the Lord's Supper that wasn't included in the lectureship, nor was it included in our study here. It's not very long, but it's known as the Pearl of Great Price. Stop and think for a minute. Have you ever found something that you just had to have and you ended up getting it, and you paid way much more than you probably should have for it. It might have been a rare coin. Could have been a one-of-a-kind item made by someone special to you. Or perhaps it was just something that you 
noticed on a trip somewhere that you got as a remembrance for that time in your life. Well, as we read about, and we will turn to Matthew chapter 13, as we read about this parable of the pearl of great price, let us consider who the merchant is and who or what the pearl is. So we can read in Matthew 13, in verses 45 and 46, where Christ says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So what is our worth? What are you worth? What am I worth? One way to think of that is the value for us is what somebody might be willing to pay for us. Well, what did God pay for us? He was willing to send his son to the earth to suffer horribly and be tortured to death in the hope that we might respond to the love that he has shown for us. And it's amazing when you think about that, it's amazing that Christ loved us so much that he was willing and obedient to his Father to take upon himself my sin our sins that we might stand guiltless purchased before God as we partake in the Lord's Supper this morning we should remember that there is only one who counts there's only one that really counts who believes that we you and me are valuable indeed and that Christ showed it by his death that cruel agonizing death that he suffered on the cross would you pray with me please oh Lord we come to you in prayer this morning and we thank you for the gift of your son to us that he took upon himself our sins and washed them away that we would have through him everlasting life with you. We thank you, Lord, that he offered up his body to be broken. And as we partake of this bread, we recall, Lord, his broken body as it hung on the cross. And as we partake, Lord, we pray that we do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for gathering us here today to remember Christ, our Lord and Savior, how he died for us as a sacrifice for our sins and to give us the opportunity to join you in heaven, to teach us the way, the lessons, the values of your love we pray that we do this in, a, in an acceptable and pleasing way. In Christ's name, amen. Shall we pray? Lord, again, we come to you in prayer and we thank you for all you have done for us. We thank you for the opportunity once again to gather as a family of yours, as children of yours, to worship and praise you. And now this opportunity that we have, Lord, to return a portion of your blessings to you for the work of uh, you here in this community. We pray that these gifts would be blessed, Lord, that you would bless the giver, and that you would give the men of this congregation wisdom in decisions to further your word throughout this community. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Stepping in the light, number 599, if you'd please turn there, 599. Bruce has our scripture reading after this song, and then Michael will bring us the word. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, Trying to follow our Savior and King, shaping our lives by His blessed example. Happy, how happy the songs that we bring. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. Walk 
walking in footsteps of gentle forbearance, footsteps of faithfulness, mercy, and love. Looking to him for the grace freely promised, happy, how happy our journey above. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light, how to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, upward, still upward, will follow our guide. When we shall see him, the King, in his beauty, Happy, how happy our place at his side. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of love. The invitation song will be 655, 655, if you'd please mark it. This morning's scripture reading comes from Mark, chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and asked him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but new wine must be put into new wineskins. Good morning, church. It's good to see everybody this morning. Went to the lectureship yesterday and Friday night, and it was, I think my favorite thing was the singing. Hearing all those people sing. There had to be, what, 250, 300 people there easy? It was beautiful singing. It was beautiful. All right, this morning I want to talk to you a little bit about the winds of change. <clears throat> If one wishes to become a disciple of Christ, they must be willing to change their life and follow his teachings alone. Years ago, my father told me a story about a preacher who had a study with a member's husband. Uh, and, and she was a Christian, of course, because she was a member. During the study, the husband became convinced that he needed to be baptized. The preacher, wanting to be sure that he fully grasped what he was undertaking, began to ask him some questions. First, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that this is his word and you have to follow all of it? Do you believe that? Why, yes, said the man. And then the preacher asked, are you willing to confess that belief before men? Of course, the man said. Are you ready to change your life, the preacher said, ready to repent? The man paused for a minute and thought. He said, no. I like my life the way it is. Hmm. The husband rejected salvation because he did not see any need to change his life. <clears throat> Many of the religious leaders of Jesus' time had this exact same view. 
The self-righteous Pharisees did not recognize that they were spiritually sick. They saw no need to change their lives. They were content walking in what they were walking in. But if one is going to become a disciple of Jesus, they must realize that changes in their life must take place. This is taught throughout the scriptures. Let's look at a couple of examples. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Chapter 6 and verse 6. Paul writes to the Christians in Rome, knowing that, let's begin in verse 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. When you are baptized, when you commit your life to Christ, you repent, and that means your old self is gone. You're going to be walking in the light in Christ's way. Now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 5 and verse 17. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That old man of sin, that old creature, that old creation is gone. You are now a new creation. The reason changes must take place is because, of our, old, because our old life will not fit into the realm of a new life in Christ. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. 1st 2 Corinthians Galatians Ephesians chapter 4 verses 17 through 24 17 through 24 of Ephesians chapter 4 This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been justified by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That person we were before our baptism, before our repentance, they're gone. You cannot continue to be that person. You must change to walk in the light and do things for Christ. Now let's go back to our scripture reading, Mark chapter 2. This is our main text here. Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. If I can find it myself. Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. <clears throat> The disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting. They came and said to him, Who do the disciples of John or why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth to an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and, and the tear is made worse. I'm sure you women know about that kind of stuff when you're patching up clothes. Of men, too. Some of you may patch up your clothes or socks or pants. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wine and the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and the wineskins are ruined. But the new wine must be put into new wineskins. New wine here is grape juice. The longer the wine sits in the wineskin, 
the fermentation process happens and it releases gases. If it's put into an old wineskin, the old wineskin will blow up because of the fermentation process. That's what Jesus is talking about here, okay? Right here, Jesus is making the point that the old does not fit with the new, that there has to be a change. <clears throat> the disciples of John and the Pharisees are upset that Jesus' disciples are not fasting, as we read. Jesus tells them the message he brings is different from what they presently believe. And it is up to them to change and follow this new teaching, not for his disciples to follow their old belief system. This is the same message for us as Christians today. If one wishes to become a disciple of Christ, they must be willing to change their life and follow his teaching. His teaching. Not some creed, not anything else. His teaching. With this in mind, let's consider the first point of our lesson this morning. Doing the right thing at the right time. Let's go back again to our main text and read verses 18 through 20. I know it's the third time, but we're going to read it again, so... Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Now, Luke postulates this as, uh, as it postu this is postulated in the Gospel of Luke during the feast at Matthew's house, okay? Let's consider Luke chapter 5, Luke's rendition of this. Luke chapter 5, verses 31 through 33. Luke 5, 31 through 33. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Then they said to him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? This is during a feast at Matthew's house. The original language here indicates that they were fasting at this specific time. As far as they are concerned, Jesus' disciples should be fasting with them. That's why they're asking Jesus this question. But they were condemning Jesus' disciples over something that was not required, even among the Jews. There was only one feast, fast, required under the old law. Only one that was required. Let's look at that fast in Leviticus chapter 16. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus chapter 16. Beginning in verse 29. Leviticus 16, 29. This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do not work at all. Afflict your souls, that's fast, okay? And do not work at all, whether a native or your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For, one, for on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. This is the only fast we see that is commanded of all the Jews in the Old Testament. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, every year, that's the only fast that they're required to do. Now, we can read that the Jews only fasted to bolster up their pretense of holiness, their holier-than-thou attitude. Look at Luke chapter 18. Let's go to, back to the Gospel of Luke chapter 18. And look at verses 11 and 12. Luke 18, 11 and 12. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. He's telling God that he fasts twice a week as if this makes him holy. This is talking about the, ta the Pharisee and not a good light, okay? <clears throat> it is easily seen that John's disciples were 
probably fasting out of grief. As a matter of fact, we can see that in Mark chapter 1 and verse 14. Go back to Mark chapter 1 and verse 14. So the, the Pharisees are fasting to show how holy they are. The disciples of John are fasting because of grief. Mark 1, 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Their, their master, teacher, was in prison for no other reason than preaching the gospel and confronting a king about his sin. So they were fasting most likely out of grief, not to show their holiness, but to show they were grieving. Neither of which applied to Jesus' disciples as he explains why. Okay, Jesus tells them in Mark chapter 2 and verse 20, but the day will, uh, verse 19, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? They're not going to fast at the wedding while the bridegroom is standing right there with them. They have no reason to mourn. They have no reason to grieve. Jesus makes it clear it would not be appropriate for his disciples to fast. <clears throat> as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast, he says in Mark chapter 2 and verse 19. You do not fast during a wedding. Uh, I don't know how many weddings you guys have been to, but I think people tend to eat at weddings, not fast at a wedding, right? The attendants are quite literally the children of the bride chamber here. They have no reason to fast. They're rejoicing in this wedding. They're happy that the bridegroom is there with them. John even recognized this. Look at John chapter 3, beginning in verse 24. The Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 3, beginning in verse 24. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, this is speaking of Jesus, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. You don't fast and cry when you're in the presence of the bridegroom. You rejoice. You're happy. Things are great when you're in the presence of the bridegroom. It is a time of joy because of what is taking place. <clears throat> Forgiveness of sins had come to the earth. I mean, before in the Old Testament, they would sacrifice things, right? Sin offerings and all these other kind of burnt offerings. But all these were for was to remind them of the sin that they had done. None of it was for forgiveness of sins. At this time, when Christ came to earth, forgiveness of sins finally came to these people. Look at Mark chapter 2 and verse 5. Mark chapter 2 and verse 5. This is just one example. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Jesus forgave the sins of the thief on the cross. Jesus forgave the sins of the adulterous woman and told her to go and sin no more. Sins, the forgiveness of sins, had come to the earth. This was a reason for rejoicing. The spiritually sick were being healed. This was a reason for rejoicing. Look at verse 17 of chapter 2 of Mark. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a, of a physician. Sorry, my tongue tied there for a second. But those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus came. He brought forgiveness of sins. He brought spiritual healing. This was a time of rejoicing, not a time of fasting and mourning. Technically, it would have been wrong for them to fast and show in a show of mourning because there was nothing to mourn about at this time. Christ was here. Jesus then explains when it will be right to fast. Let's consider chapter 2 and verse 20 here of Mark. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. When the bridegroom is taken away, 
The phrase taken away is subjective passive, which means someone literally takes him away. Many believe that this is the Christ making reference to his own crucifixion. I believe this is Christ making reference to his own crucifixion. That's the day that they will mourn and fast, the day that Christ is, is hung on the tree. But it will be only temporary, as we see in the words, in those days at the very end. And then they will fast in those days, only in those days when he's taken from them, because Christ knows he's coming back. It is true that Jesus' disciples were acting contrary to what was commonly believed and practiced. But things were changing. And as disciples, they were willing to change their lives and follow his every teaching. Jesus' disciples were doing the right thing at the right time. <clears throat> they were rejoicing because it was a time of rejoicing, not a time of mourning and fasting. The Pharisees did not realize that their old way of thinking had no place in what Jesus offered. And in the next few verses, he explains this to them. This brings us to our second point here in our sermon. The old is not compatible with the new. Let's read verses 21 and 22 of Mark chapter 2. 21 and 22 of Mark chapter 2. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. Luke refers to this as a parable, actually, in his, in his gospel, a way Jesus taught those around him. Look at Luke chapter 5 and verse 36. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 5. And verse 36. Then he spoke a parable to them, Luke says. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one, otherwise the new makes a tear. And also the piece that was taken out of the new one does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into the old wineskin, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. So this is a parable of Christ. Christ is teaching us here in a parable. And in this parable, Jesus uses their question about fasting to explain that his teachings are so unlike their present Pharisaical traditions, the two are simply not compatible. To show how this is the case, he gives them two illustrations. And both of these illustrations, although similar, convey different messages. Consider some things about the first illustration in verse 21 here. Let's... Go back to Mark chapter 2, our main text, and look at verse 21. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth to an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. The new cloth pulls away from the old, thus the new has power over the old. The old cloth has a worse tear, thus it is weak. It is weaker than the new. The two are simply not compatible. You cannot mix the old with the new. Your old life with the new life, the old law with the new law, your old religious beliefs from a denomination you came out of with your new religious beliefs founded upon faith in Christ's word. Consider some of the things about the second illustration now. Look at verse 22. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. The new wine bursts the old wineskins. Thus the new, again, has power. The old wineskins burst open. Thus the old is weak. <clears throat> the two are simply not compatible. You cannot mix the old with the new. Jesus is stating this clearly to us. You cannot mix them together. So what are the different messages these two illustrations convey? These two illustrations are conveying two different messages. What are they? If you notice Mark chapter 2 and verse 21 about the old garment and the new cloth is dealing with a partial mending. Okay, He's not mending it completely. He's putting new cloth on the old one. The patch or Christ's teaching is stronger than the old garment or pharisaical Judaism. 
the patching does not destroy the garment completely, but it does make it even more useless than it already is. It has a bigger tear. The point is, you cannot attempt to patch the old belief system with his new teaching. Can't try to incorporate it in there to make the old belief better. The old belief is done. Bring about the new and listen to God's new teaching. Let's consider Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 2. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 2. 1 Second Corinthians, Galatians. Two through four. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law, the old law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. You cannot mix the old with the new. It doesn't go. It doesn't. It's like putting a square peg in a round hole. It doesn't work. <clears throat> now let us notice Mark chapter 2 and verse 22. Okay, go back to our main text, Mark chapter 2 and verse 22. Jesus is talking about the wineskins. Remember, you can't put the old wine or the new wine into the old wineskins because it'll cause it to burst. We don't need to read it again. He is speaking of an entire filling up of something old. This isn't just, I dumped a little bit of new wine into my old wineskins. This is filling up the entire old wineskin with something new, okay? The new wine of Christ's teachings is so powerful that it cannot be contained with the old hardened traditions of Pharisaical Judaism. The old wineskins, Pharisaical Judaism. The scenario is so dangerous that to try and mix the two will cause them to be completely lost. As we read here in Galatians chapter 5, fallen from grace. <clears throat> Excuse me. The point is, you cannot mix the whole of one with the whole of the other. In doing so, they both lose their complete identity. The new must stand on its own, <clears throat> in its own new wineskin, unpolluted by the old Pharisaical Judaism. Same with our old belief system that we had before we were converted and became Christians. Let's consider Galatians chapter 3 now. Galatians chapter 3. Verses 10 through 12. Galatians 3, 10 through 12. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is... So one sin, and you are cursed under the old law. Because it says... In Deuteronomy 27, 26. If you don't do all these laws according to exactly as God wrote them, you're cursed. All right? But that, one, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For, that, for the just shall live by faith, Paul says. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written... Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The new has come. The old is done. He finished it. He fulfilled it. Now, by way of illustration, let's look at Hebrews chapter 8. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 8. Beginning in verse 7. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Now skip down and notice <clears throat> verse 13. And that he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what has become obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. 
Pharisaical Judaism had become an old, worn-out, tattered garment. Over the years, it had become stiff, hardened, and without elasticity. It was only able to hold the, amount, the old, corrupt teachings of the Pharisees now. What Jesus brought was new and sweet. <clears throat> it was strong and powerful. It was unlike anything they had ever heard. It was the true, uncorrupt word of God. <laughs> this new teaching was not intended to mend the old religious teachings of the Pharisees. And like new wine that ferments, it would have expanded beyond the hardened band boundaries of Pharisaical Judaism. And it did on many occasions we can read throughout the scriptures. This new teaching would call out to those whom the Pharisees rejected. Things were changed, and one wishing to become a disciple of Jesus must be willing to change their life and follow his teaching. Not any other teaching, just his teaching. The only option is to abandon the old and prepare a place for the new. Because the old is not compatible with the new. The old man of sin is not compatible with the new born baby in Christ. You can't be who you were and who God wants you to be at the same time. You make that decision when you repent before you're baptized. My brethren, today we know the bridegroom has come. And he has invited us all to share in his joy. Amen? He wants us all to share in his joy. Our life is just a vapor here. And then where do we get to go? Heaven, eternally. I can't wait for that day. This is a time of rejoicing for us. Christ has brought forgiveness of sins. He has brought spiritual healing to us all. And all we have to do is change our minds and walk in his ways. Like those disciples of old, we must do the right thing at the right time. We must respond to his call and be spiritually healed. Like those disciples of old, we must realize the old is not compatible with the new. Our old life just won't do. Wait, that rhymed. Sorry about that. Christianity is not a patch. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. Let's look at that real quick. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This is not a patch on your old clothes. This is a whole new garment you're putting on as a Christian. You have changed your ways. You're done with the old and you're putting Christ on in baptism. Christianity cannot be mixed with old lifestyles or religious belief systems. We don't try to bring our beliefs from any other religion into Christ's church. We change and do what Christ teaches us. There's a reason why we left that old self. We knew that it wasn't true, and we were taught the truth. Christianity is a standard unto itself, and all who come to it must be willing to be transformed. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We have to be changed. We have to allow ourselves to be transformed. We have to renew our minds to focus on this word, God's word, and that's it. Sadly, there are some who will not get this. Some will refuse to change because they like things the way that they are. Look at Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 and verse 39. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new. For he says, the old is better. There are people who would rather have that fermented wine that's going to make them all loopy and make them feel like they're fine other than that new, fresh grape juice that Jesus brought to us to show us the true way, to spiritually heal us, to give us forgiveness of sins. We have to do away with the old. Do not be the person that is stuck in your old self because that's not okay with God. And you're going you're gonna to answer for that on Judgment Day if you haven't been able to change yourself to walk in God's ways. And I say you us, any of us, in the entirety of this world. <clears throat> Come and taste the sweet words of Christ Jesus. 
Let the power of that word strengthen you to start a new life clothed in Christ only. If you wish to become a disciple of Jesus, you must be willing to change your life and follow his teachings. You must first hear the word as you have today, for faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by this word, the word of God. Romans 10, 17, the only word that can give you faith to salvation. You must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, John 8, 24. You must repent or change your old self into something new to walk in the light <clears throat> because God commands it. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. You must confess your belief that Jesus is the Christ openly before men, Matthew 10, 32, and he will confess you before his Father in heaven, Matthew 10, 33. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38, and the Lord will add you to his church, the one church, Christ's church, Acts 2, 47. Then you must, as we all must, live a life faithfully for Christ, walking in the light, 1 John 1, 6 and 7, even to the point of death because of what you believe, and you will receive a glorious crown of life in heaven, Revelation 2.10. If you have yet to make that change of mind and are ready to follow the narrow path, the waters of baptism are ready for you. Or if you find that you are faltering between your old life and your new life, we're here to encourage you. We want to, we want to pray for you. Don't be embarrassed if you need prayers for any situation. That's what we're here for. We're here to build each other up, to pray for one another daily and make sure that we're all seen on that straight and narrow path. Whatever you need, please come forward as we stand and sing. sit down. Our closing song will be number 626, number 626, and please sing the first and last verse, and then Kurt has our closing prayer and some announcements. How sweet will be the welcome home when this short life is o'er, when pain and sorrow, grief and
and care shall trouble <coughs> us no more. Welcome home, sweet welcome home, my home, sweet home. A welcome home, sweet welcome home, the Christians welcome home. If we are faithful, we shall gain the land of promise rest, where <coughs> we shall live and be forever blessed. Welcome home, sweet welcome home, my home, sweet home. A welcome home, sweet welcome home, the Christians welcome home. Shall we pray? Lord, we come before you again in prayer, and we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to study from your word. We pray, Lord, that the lessons that we've learned today can be truly written on our hearts and in our minds at, as we go through our daily lives. We can apply these lessons and let your light shine through us. We thank you, Lord, for your Son who so loved us so much. We thank you, Lord, for all of the workers that are spread out throughout the world that are spreading your gospel. We pray, Lord, that their efforts would be beneficial and that others would be led to you, that they might have everlasting life through Christ. We pray that as we go about our day-to-day -day lives, Lord, that you would give us, give us wisdom to make the right choices to live as Christians ought. We pray for those that are not with us today, Lord, for whatever the reason. Some are ill and are healing. Some are traveling and are away from us. We pray, Lord, that you would take care of those folks as you providentially do all of us and bring them back to us that they might be with us again at some point in the future. All these things we pray, Lord, in your son's name. Amen. Again, we should mention that there has been some significant uh, damage to our, our building downstairs due to the flooding that happened there a, a week or so ago. Uh, if you want to know more about that, uh, talk with Michael or Stephen or Brian. Uh, there might be something that you can do to assist with those, with that. So um, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, we need workers. Don't forget the gospel meeting coming up on May 15th. Uh, be prepared to help us uh, spread the word about that. We have a door knocking campaign coming up just before that. Don't be afraid to ask your friends and neighbors to join you in this gospel meeting. Set that time aside and really plan to attend so that our congregation as a whole is well represented uh, together with those that will join us from throughout the community. 
Ladies, don't forget about the ladies' retreat coming up later this month on the 22nd. That's going to be over at the DeBar congregation. And there's information about that on the bulletin board or on their website. Again, ladies, don't forget to send those cards to your secret sisters. There's a note here regarding a sign-up sheet. It must be in the foyer out there. Uh, for needs that need to be addressed for our gospel meeting. Uh, there's going to be potlucks, there's going to be desserts, there's going to be a need for child care and those sorts of things. Uh, see what you can do to help out to make that meeting a success. And lastly, don't forget those that are listed on our bulletin that uh, are on our prayer list. Uh, that's where the prayer list is appearing now, is in our bulletin board. Be sure and keep those folks in your prayers. And I have no other announcements, and so we are dismissed. Have a good afternoon and a week ahead.